So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us um, for the webinar today brought to you by the Secondary Literacy Partnership, Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, and a whole child approach to education. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Secondary Literacy Partnership, since 2012, we've been um, bringing um, live webinars uh, on topics related to secondary literacy to um, all of you and the associations involved are listed here. We have the association, the California School Administrators, the California County Superintendents of Education and our colleagues from the California Department of Education and I'm from the California and Delphine from the California Comprehensive Center and California Teachers Association. So you can see this is uh, takes a village in a partnership and so we all collaborate to bring you these um, webinars. The focus, it's our mission statement. I'll just take a pause and let you read it quickly. The main thing is that we've really focused on empowering students in secondary schools and around secondary literacy. Whoops, someone's pushing my slides. Um, the series we're focusing on, this is, I think, our seventh series, and we're focusing on voices, access, and equity. And our focus is specifically on strategies to support literacy across the disciplines. We did um, our previous self webinar we did was on focused on discipline literacy, and we did it through the lens of social emotional learning. I'm just curious if you're opening the chat, how many of you attended a previous uh, secondary literacy webinar. You just want to type in the chat and open up the chat if you've attended these webinars in the past. Thank you. I see some folks saying yes. This is my first. Betty, welcome with you. Thank you. I haven't yet. So this is a really good treasure chest. All the webinars we've done, like the 30 plus in the past, have all been archived and are tagged. And we have just launched our um, secondary literacy channel in our Collaborate in Common um, shared space that is initiative from the California Department of Education. So we'll talk, tell you more about how you can access those resources from past webinars. We really encourage our philosophy is to not only share knowledge and, and experiences with you, but also to learn with and from you. So we encourage you to use the chat and that's why we're introducing um, breakout groups. So you have time to share with your, each other your own experiences. Delphine did such a thorough job of going over the um, interface on the left, basically, is your mute. The middle is the participants button, and then there's a chat. Um, so please open up the chat if you haven't already done so, and feel free to start typing in and telling us more about yourselves. We practiced the webinar. Now we're just going to uh, quickly launch a poll here. And I can't see my interface, so I will um, launch this poll and ask you about what your role is. So if you could. Uh, I can that. Do you see the poll? We're getting a lot of good results. Thank you for answering the poll in the pop-up window. Great. So we did this before. We gave people a, few, a bit of seconds. Do you want to just um, show the results quickly? So on the call, we've got more people coming. Lots of folks say other. So I'm really curious if you have the other hat on, if you could tell us and type into the chat. So we'll keep on moving here. Thank you. Now we want to ask you, we saw a lot of people are very familiar. Could you uh, let us know in this poll about how would you see yourself and your familiarity with um, social emotional learning? Thank you. Linda says A, very familiar. So if you want to click and type at the button, if it's popped up in your screen, and do we have most people doing that poll down? 60% uh, of participants have voted. Yeah, well, that's great. So some folks have, we'll keep on moving if you want to just, this will help us. So Brent, today um, there's some, a few people who say they're very familiar. So that's very exciting. So we really would love you to share your own experiences and somewhat familiar. And a uh, few people are saying just starting. So. Brent, just wanted to say that that's just how the folks are. Uh, um, and the just provide us with new, be new benchmarks. So that's great. We'll close yeah. that poll and keep moving. So 
I uh, would like to just re quickly review the agenda. We'll go back here. Um, this is how it looks. I've just got to we'll do a quick icebreaker. Then Brent will lead and tell about how the county office has been implementing NYSEL and um, lots of different information. We'll look at the Hill Den, look at exploring the California emotional learning guideline principles. Then we'll do our breakouts. So that's how the day is going to be planned. And Arlene, I'd like to now introduce, take it away to you to give us a bit of background about what's been happening in the California context. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is Aline Allison Zaria. I work for the California Department of Education in the Educator Excellence and Equity Division. So I'm very happy to be participating in uh, this webinar and this great work um, that Brent will provide you uh, much more detail than I will about in the coming slides. But I just wanted to uh, start out by giving you a little bit of background. A few years ago, the California Department of Education along with representatives from more than 20 California education organizations and systems, came together to affirm SEL as an essential part of a well-rounded quality education in all youth-serving settings. Uh, this group developed uh, a guidance document called the SEL Guiding Principles, and we now have that posted on Collaboration in Common, and we'll be able to direct you there um, during this webinar. These principles are intended to inform and support strong SEL practices across the state, and they can be resources to schools, districts, youth-serving organizations, et cetera, um, in, well, first of all, districts for developing LCAP goals uh, to help uh, complement their multi-tiered system of support system. Uh, also to set school or district leadership team priorities inform the design of professional learning, instructional approaches, and curricula adoption. And the principles can also be used in determining assessment methodologies, tools, and in the building of coalitions of families and community stakeholders. Now, you can see, um, actually, if you could go back one slide, you can see how there are three district-developed SEL standards uh, boxes there. So that really shows that these principles really need to be refined to meet the unique needs of each community and so that they can be used to measure progress towards shared social and emotional learning goals um, unique to their own context. So um, this is how they're going to look differently around the state depending on who the students are. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, so MTSS, you can see this umbrella here, uh, is shown as an umbrella uh, under which other resources and initiatives are encompassed and aligned. So this umbrella symbolizes the protective factor of California MTSS for all students. So it helps, uh, MTSS helps districts and schools develop a framework for teaching and providing interventions around academic behavior and social emotional supports that address the needs of the whole child. So MTSS then provides a method through which resources and initiatives such as SEL can be aligned within the district. Um, you may be aware that the Orange County Department of Education is heading up the SUMS initiative at scaling up MTSS around the state. And this was three separate, this is the result of three separate budget acts uh, in the California state budget to appropriate uh, up, now up to $45 million to them to do this work. And we can, uh, on our website, there is more information about the work if you're interested, and we can refer you to that link as well. So thank you, Eileen. We uh, just have a quick icebreaker now because we want to gather quick your reflections. And, and the through line for us is as being the secondary literacy partnership, I was always thinking about this work through the lens of literacy. So um, I'm not sure how many of you get... Um, Ed, Ed Search. This is an article we sent out, and we're wondering um, how many of you had time, and if you had time to read this article, what's something that resonated with you about how the, um, the teacher, Brian, was introducing micro-learning as having an impact on identity? So any thoughts of folks who read that about what resonated for them as it relates to social-emotional learning in the context of the secondary classroom? You have a moment here. Also, 
put the link in to where this document is. everyone. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Mary Ann. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, it stood out that the teacher provides platforms for students to share their own experiences. And the sentence status. I think yeah, the idea of creating a classroom where students feel comfortable enough to share their stories and take risk and learn with and from one another. <coughs> The strategies that were shared, I'm sure you're all familiar with them, but it was a good reminder that um, about the, the confidence and the relationship building and at all the differentiation levels. So just keep moving. Thank you for reading that and sharing your reflections with us. Um, but without any further ado then, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Eileen to introduce Brent and we'll move from there. And Brent, you can share your screen. Sounds good. Yes, it is my pleasure to introduce Brent Malicote, who was involved in the Collaborating States Initiative all along. And he is currently the Director in Educational Services uh, over at the Sacramento County Office of Education. So welcome, Brent. Thank you very much. Can I get a thumbs up if you're seeing um, the, the screen here with my picture in the introductory slide? Are we, are we good to go? Are you guys seeing it? We're good to go. Thank you. Awesome. Well, first, um, thank you uh, to the Secondary Literacy Partnership. I've, I've learned a ton about Zoom in the last couple of days, and I've got to say I'm seeing it as a platform that we probably need to be using a whole lot more. I didn't realize the uh, capacity that, that, that we could get from, from something like this. So thank you. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, my name is Brent Malicote. Um, I work um, as the director um, in educational services. I work with curriculum and, and instruction as well as prevention and early intervention with the Sacramento County Office of Education. Um, had quite a few experiences in education over the years. I, our, our, our partner from Arizona, my first teaching job was actually on the Havasupai Reservation at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Um, I've, so I've been a teacher for many years. I've been a vice principal, principal, charter school director, um, and uh, worked at the California Department of Education with Aline and Jennifer for a couple of years now at the Sacramento County Office of Ed. And really, again, just a, a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, we are, we're going to be talking about social and emotional learning. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our um, uh, community of practice that we've started here in Sacramento County. Um, but I'm also um, just seeing from the poll before, I, that's, I, I predicted that we would be, uh, we would have all kinds of experience from our participants today. And so we will be just setting a, a bit of a stage for social emotional learning, creating some common definitions, um, those sorts of things as well. So. Let's start with what is social emotional learning. Um, I do want to I want to point out in the bottom right hand uh, corner of your screen, you'll see CASEL, uh, which stands for the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. Um, really, just an amazing think tank um, out of the Chicago, um, Illinois area. Um, really focusing on social emotional learning. A wealth of resources um, can be found on on their website, and I really do. I love the the um, kind of the definition they've got for social emotional learning here. And what I'd like everybody to do is, is take a minute um, to read this definition. And when you get to the, um, um, the italicized part here, think about a middle school student. Um, I always think uh, when, when I um, introduce this definition and ask people to relate it to a middle school student that they may have worked with or know, I think it really, it rings true. So just take a minute to read that. So I've got a sixth grade daughter, um, and when I, hear, when I read, to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, 
and make responsible decisions. I think of so many things that my daughter is dealing with every day and the skills that are really important for her. Not to say that this is important for elementary school students or high school students, but I think that when you start thinking about those emotions and all that's going on with a middle schooler, I think it really rings true. So hope that you can refer back to this definition um, over time. And uh, Brent, I also think of the, ad the research on the adolescent brain that's coming up about yeah. all the different um, domain development. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as was mentioned before, and um, I will do a little bit of a plug right now, um, we have started a community of practice in Sacramento County um, where we really are bringing teams of educators together to, um, to share and, and uh, network around best practices for social and emotional learning. And when I say that this is a plug, um, I guess what I'm, what I'm, uh, th there's no fee for this. Um, our next one is coming up on November 13th. I would welcome anybody who can get to Sacramento and would like to do, uh, would like to be a part of our community of practice. I would really, I would welcome you to be there. But we have three main goals um, with this community of practice. One is, is that it's professional learning. Um, it's, it's about learning the, the, the latest research, understanding tools and resources around social and emotional learning. So really that professional learning aspect. Um, networking and sharing of best practices is also very important with this group. Um, I, I pulled up a, a definition of a community of practice before we started today. Um, a community of practice is a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. And, I think that, that says it all for this, this, this community of practice. And the third piece is um, we always offer team planning time um, as part of the community of practice agenda. Um, and this really, this speaks to the idea that we ask teams to come so that when they go back to their, um, their own context and to their own districts and sites, um, they can really affect change around social and emotional learning. So again, excited about this. You can see the, the registration uh, there again. Um, I think we've got about 40 spots left out of 140, um, and we would welcome you to come with a team to, to join us at an upcoming community of practice. Brent, just a quick question from the chat. Is this virtual or face-to-face? -face? This is face-to-face. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if we might not do something virtual, though there may be an opportunity with Zoom or some other platform to, uh, to get that up and running in the future. But for now, it's been face-to-face. -face. Thank you for that question. And Julie, if you would, just keep an eye on those chats and, and, and um, announce them to me. Yes, we'll do. So please throw, put your questions as we go along. Brent's really happy to answer them as we go along. And I think this is a question back to you after you explain it. Yep. So we have... Um, uh, up on the screen now is uh, the Castle Wheel. Again, this is another Castle resource. And I do want to put out there that California um, decided not to create uh, standards for social and emotional learning. I failed to mention at the beginning that another role that I have is I'm the co-lead for the social and emotional learning state team um, for, for California, along with, with my colleague Jennifer Peck. Um, and when we got the team together, uh, we quickly realized that um, the team thought that it wouldn't be the best idea to create another set of standards, especially in light of Common Core standards and NGSS and all the standards that are, are out there right now. Um, people thought that there might be a chilling effect with creating another set of standards where it would be seen as one more thing uh, rather than something that um, needs to be uh, brought in in the context of the district or in the school. So um, we really point to CASEL's uh, five core competencies quite a bit um, when we're talking to districts and talking to schools about, um, you know, uh, uh, good practices, good resources, um, good ideas when, it's, when it comes to um, building your own set of, of core competencies or standards. And so you can see here self-management, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness along with some skills that are, are listed along with each of these. And so let's take a minute um, um, and you'll see the poll question are down there in the bottom, which of these five competencies resonate with you? Um, and, and maybe another way to think about it, are, any, are you working in your school or district on any one of these um, in particular? Is there a focus that you have right now? And if you would uh, um, put that in the chat, that would be great.
Brent, you can see the chat, right? I can, yep. Just brought it back up again. Thank you. Yeah, I like this. Uh, relationship skills are needed for teachers and students. Many of my discipline incidents have their roots here. Um, I believe that uh, just as you do, who was that from, from, uh, from Kevin? Thanks for posting that. As a principal, um, this was one of the things that we always were working on. Uh, relationships from, from staff to staff, from staff to student, from staff to parent, from student to parent, um, all these different relationships are so critical um, to the success of students. Yes, thank you, uh, Mary Ann, saying starting with the teachers, adults first. We're actually, we're gonna talk about this a little more explicitly later on, uh, just about the importance of adult social and emotional learning. And I continue to hear from schools and districts that are looking for tools and resources um, and better understanding about how to handle that. Yeah, the relationship piece seems to be really coming up strong here. So thank you for, um, for responding and, 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 and discussing in the chat. Brent, was one question about how did they find out which of these five competencies? Is this based on evidence-based work, someone asked? Say that again, Julie. How did they choose which of the, how did they come up with the, these as the five competencies? Was it based on some sort of research? Yeah, it's that? research. And if you go to the castle website, I don't want to get too much into that because we could really get in the weeds. But they, <laughs> yes. Yeah, they've got, a, they've got a lot around the research on how these were selected. Um, you'll see the kind of the arrangement in red and blue um, here. So self-management and self-awareness being that intra-personality um, kind, of, kind of piece, the blue being the inter, uh, and then the convergence of the intra and the inter to make good responsible decisions. So um, that, that kind of helps with maybe a little bit of the color coding, but I would really point you to the, uh, uh, to the CASEL website to learn more. And Lynn says, we use the California pyramid model for young children developed by the Center for Social Emotional Learning for Early Childhood from Vanderbilt. Got it, yes. Va Vanderbilt's got some really terrific resources. Thank you for sharing that. So the, the next piece is just a, um, an example. This is actually from Sacramento City Unified School District. They were one of CASEL's collaborating uh, districts, uh, one of the original districts in the Collaborating Districts Initiative. And they've been doing a lot of great work in social emotional learning for about six or seven years now. Um, and they took the wheel that you saw before and really made it their own. And you'll, I, I really appreciate how they've gone with this idea of we are, we belong, and we can. And you'll notice that the, the five um, pieces of the wheel from Castle are all recognized here. And they've even gone to the extent of creating some indicators, which um, I also think are very strong. And they added one more to develop growth mindset. Um, so I, the reason that I wanted to share this one was because there's, there's a lot of ways to think about um, social emotional learning and core competencies and standards. And it's really, it's about getting a leadership team together that's representative of your, of your district uh, to think about what this needs to look like. So just really wanted to share that. And you'll see the, at the bottom, please share your district's work of creating your own standards, core competencies, important for students and teachers. Um, if you would, in the chat bar, are there um, examples of competencies other than CASEL that you, that you may have used? Have you used CASELs and adapted them to make them really personal for the work that you're doing or something else? Washington State Benchmarks, Anchorage, Alaska, also one of the collaborating districts. Um, so um, Oakland, um, Anchorage, Alaska, um, as well as Sacramento City, those are three that I know of. There are others as well, but yes, Anchorage has got some really great resources. Growth mindset and self-efficacy, awesome. And they fold their relationship skills into social awareness. Fantastic. Yeah, and then New York State, they've gone down the road of, of um, benchmarks and I think a standards route, if that's right, Karen, or uh, Kevin. All right, I am gonna move us along just to make sure that we're, um, 
um, staying on time. So um, for those of you that are out of state, um, a little bit of a, an apology up front, but um, this may be something that you would, would consider as well. So California has 10 state priorities as part of the local control funding formula. Uh, priority one being basic services, priority two, state standards, uh, priority three, parental involvement, pupil achievement, pupil engagement, school climate, course access, other pupil outcomes, and then nine and 10 for county offices being expelled pupils and foster youth. Where do you think SEL fits in the 10 state priorities? Take a minute to just type into the chat bar. What do you, what do you recognize as being um, uh, critical uh, for SEL in, in, in any one of these priorities or more? School climate, everywhere, engagement, And it is, I, I, I don't think it's that much of a trick question. If you really start to dig in and you look at education code um, around the 10 state priorities, I think SEL um, integrated well fits into each one of these 10 state priorities. So when you're working on LCAPs or you're really advocating for social and emotional learning in your district, um, just going to the 10 state priorities, I think is a really important piece that you can do. So this next piece, um, really just some um, uh, building some more understanding. Um, I think there is some challenge around definitions um, across the state and really across the country. And I think it creates confusion, but maybe unnecessarily so. Um, I think what people often try to do is they try to, um, they try to segment these things off into their own pieces. And Really, um, when you look at each of these different kinds of skills, programs, um, mindsets that, that we bring to, to school each day, it's, it's not that any one of these is social and emotional learning, but I would argue that every one of them could contribute to really strong social and emotional learning program in a, in a school or in a district. Um, so um, I really encourage people, don't get too caught up in the definitions of any one uh, program that a school is doing, use social and emotional learning as an umbrella with a lot of different opportunities uh, to build those skills. And you'll see a lot of um, examples that are, that are listed here. A little bit of research, um, and this is really so, for those of you that are um, working to um, maybe get SEL um, built into your own programs, um, what we find is, is that with social emotional learning, uh, kids score nine percentile points higher in pro-social behavior. That may not be a surprise. Um, and then nine percentile points lower in conduct problems. The piece that I really love here is that, um, that 11% being the biggest of any of the numbers here is what you find when it comes to academic achievement. When SEL programming is performed in schools, kids perform academically. Um, and so it really, it's, 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 about, um, it's about that whole child approach that's, that's so important. When supporting the whole child, uh, the pro-social behavior, the conduct problems, all those things go up and down the, the trends that you would like to see. But at the end of the day, kids are also performing better academically. Um, and that's just an important stat, I think, to, to bring up. Brent, I just asked folks in the chat, did any of these results and the ones that you're showing them are surprising them? I think yeah, thank you. I question on the next slide, too. Yeah, we can definitely take a minute to do that. So leave that one up for just another few seconds, and then I'll move on to the next one. And um, for, for both of these, um, these results slides, yeah, any, any surprises here? Terry says no surprises yep. at all on their side. So does Holly. So yeah, folks. I think is really important um, for, well, a lot of different reasons, but teachers believe SEL benefits students in school, work, and life. 97% of teachers say that students from all types of backgrounds, both affluent and poor, would benefit from learning SEL skills in schools. I just find that so encouraging um, that Almost all teachers uh, believe that social emotional learning is going to benefit all the kids in their classroom. 87% um, uh, say that it will prepare students for the workforce, as well as students becoming good citizens as adults. 80% um, say that it will uh, students' ability to move successfully through school and stay on track to graduate 
will be increased and 79% say it will prepare students to get to and through college. I guess maybe the only surprise for me in this one is, is that only 79% of teachers think that it would prepare students to get to and through college. So um, while we've got some really positive numbers here, there's still some work to do as well. So if you've got any other um, um, uh, surprises, and then also you can see the, um, the, the, the question down at the bottom, have you found challenges with creating buy-in around SEL in your school or district? If so, what are some of the strategies that you've used to try to help get people on board? Folks, if you want to share something quickly by unmuting your phone, you could put your hand up if you would like to chime in that way instead of the chat for this particular response. Time at the secondary level, yes. Time is always, it's such a challenge. Um, especially with the teacher shortage and having um, to be able to get substitutes, to be able to get people the release time, to be able to really think about this and work together and collaborate about how to, how to get better. Secondary, yep. Yeah. So Natalie, thank you for your response. I started in my own class. People felt there wasn't time but it has saved time and less classroom problems. So true. And I think that's that conduct problem um, stat that we saw from the slide before. So keep those coming. I'm gonna continue on here. So we're gonna have a poll and I think Delphine's gonna, she's gonna put this one up for us. Share the types of approaches to SEL happening at your school site. And let me explain each of these um, a little bit. So, um, some schools are in, let me, let's see. Sorry for that. Um, some schools are infusing SEL in teaching practices um, uh, to create, so this one's really about that learning environment. Um, what is it the teachers are doing to really improve the learning envi environment by um, increasing the social and emotional learning opportunities that, that students and adults have. The second one, infusing SEL instruction into ac an academic curriculum. So we know with the Common Core Standards, there's a lot of opportunities, and we'll take a look at a few of these in just a little bit, um, about how to infuse SEL, integrate SEL into an academic curriculum. The, the uh, letter C here, creating policies and organi organizational structures that support students' social and emotional development. So. LCAP work, really um, working with boards of education to make sure that the, uh, the critical nature, the importance of the work that's happening at that, that policy level. And then the final one here, directly teaching SEL skills and freestanding lessons. And I don't wanna um, promote any single um, SEL um, curriculum, but there are some good ones out there and people have found success there as well. Thanks for the responses here. Directly teaching SEL skills and freestanding lessons seems to be um, where a lot of people are. Great. And um, there's some questions in the, uh, just reflections that also came up um, in the chat. Rebecca said there's a special ed person who's been in special education for years, they've been addressing social emotional issues along with academic goals. So she's excited to see that work coming in through Gen Ed. Yep. And, um, Kevin says there's a lot of cooperative learning strategies to be addressed in SEL. And Holly said, can we ask what your state chose for SEL curriculum? See, what was that last question again? What the state showed, what um, California chose for a curriculum for SEL. I think she's a, I don't, we don't have a curriculum. There's no, we don't, we don't have a, a particular curriculum that is promoted or adopted. Um, we'll get to, we, we've, our, our first work has been around a set of guiding principles, which we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. Um, and we can share more about that. So that's just a chime check, Brent, for this section. I think we're about five minutes left so that's great okay so
So all right. Um, really, this is just an opportunity to call out and celebrate a lot of terrific work um, that's happening in California around social and emotional learning. Um, I mentioned earlier that we didn't go down the road of standards as a state, um, but one place that we do have standards is actually in the California preschool curriculum framework. And um, while these are designed for preschool students, um, they, they really wouldn't need to stop. Um, at preschool. These would work all the way through elementary school into middle school and high school, I think, for a lot of them. So a really great resource. Excited about the work that the State Board of Education is doing um, around school climate. Um, the, you saw um, um, with the 10 state priorities before, um, priority six being around school climate and social emotional learning being called out often in state board meetings and how we get this to districts and schools, the kinds of resources um, and tools that they're, they're seeking. Um, we've got the guiding principles, which again, we'll be talking about in a little bit. Both Oakland Unified School District and Sac Sacramento City Unified School District were two of the collaborating districts with CASEL. Some terrific work happening there with a lot of resources on their website that I would encourage you to take a look at. The core districts, um, they've got all kinds of work happening in social emotional learning. Um, one that I would really encourage you to take a look at uh, for CORE is they're doing a lot around the measurement of social and emotional learning and finding out um, more about school climate and how social and emotional learning and school climate really contribute to success for student um, in, in, in terms of the whole child. So CORE is a, is a great resource. Um, you'll see a blueprint for great schools here. Um, this was a, um, a publication put out by the state superintendent where he makes, um, he calls out social emotional learning as being a really important part of um, supporting the whole child. And then you'll see expanding student success and the partnership for children and youth. They've been doing a lot of really terrific work in the area of after school, summer, um, all kinds of expanded learning opportunities. And really, I think some of the best work in California right now is happening in after school programs. Um, and um, at our last community of practice meeting, we saw a great example of this. Uh, Visalia Unified School District, we had them come up to do our, our district spotlight. They spent about two and a half hours talking about the work that they've been doing. And it was really interesting that it was actually the expanded learning program, the after school program, um, where, the, um, where social and emotional learning was really made a priority in that program. And then it, it backed into the school day, which was really interesting. And so they've got this alignment happening between um, the regular school day and the expanded learning school day um, that I think is really interesting to, uh, to take a look at. But all kinds of great uh, examples of SEL happening in expanded learning as well. So this is a time for a pause for reflections, comments, and questions. So, have we just had some comments, Aline or Jennifer, have you seen things that have come up that you'd like Brent to just address before we go in a little further into some of the specifics about the standards? I mean, the guidelines. I'm caught out, Brent. <laughs> the guidelines. <Yeah. laughs> it's okay. And, uh, no, this is Aline. I, I don't have any uh, specific comments about that, but I noticed that Holly asked a question about a state adopted uh, curriculum for SEL. And I don't know, uh, Brent, actually California does not have a state adopted curriculum, but Brent, did you want to address that? I did a little bit, Aline, but yeah, thanks okay. for bringing it up again. Okay. I, I, I think that, um, and, and I will, let me, let me get to that piece um, as we get into the guiding principle, because I think Perfect. we have exciting work to share. However, it's not a state adopted curriculum that we're asking everyone to use. Uh, again, when the state team came together, well, it's been about two and a half years ago, um, they made a very deliberate decision uh, to not, um, uh, not create standards, not have a state adopted curriculum for the sole reason that there was a lot of great work happening across the state already and we didn't we, we didn't want to have people um, require them to back up and start over um, instead we're, we're we're doing a lot of learning from each other so yeah um, Kevin asked a question of me but I think it's um, 
for you is um, one of the connections that he doesn't see addressed in the SEL literature is culture. Can you speak a little to this? Yeah, so access and equity. Um, and I'm actually, that's going to be um, um, guiding principle number two uh, for California is a commitment to equity. Um, I would really, Kevin, encourage you to take a look at our guiding principles document. Again, we're going to be we're going to be looking at this together um, in in just a minute. Um, but there, I think there are some really great suggestions around how to commit to equity in the area of social emotional learning and using social and emotional learning as a vehicle uh, to increase access and equity for our students with greatest needs. So um, yeah, we'll get to that in just a second. Thank you for bringing that up. And you know, someone else had asked a question earlier about um, uh, bringing in families um, with SEL, and I know that that's guiding principle number four, so maybe I'm skipping ahead and you're going to talk about this already, but yeah. I was wondering if maybe um, you might want to share like anything that you're doing at the county um, specifically to involve families and communities. Yes, thank you. Well, and let's, let's do that when we get to number four. Okay. All right, I think we're, the questions are really revolving around the guiding principles, which is awesome. Well, oh, let's nice segue. Thank you, everyone. Please keep your questions coming. We appreciate you being at this late hour, especially those of you from also from back east. So thanks. Yeah. So um, what you see here um, is the, our, our uh, California social emotional learning guiding principles. There are five of them. Um, the first one is adopt whole child development as the goal of education. Number two is a commitment to equity. Number three is build capacity. Number four is partner with families and community. And number five is learn and improve. Now, this is the one pager. Um, we, we, uh, we've realized in California that whenever we're building a document that's more than four or five pages, we need to also build a one pager just to help with access for those people that are really, um, people in schools are stretched for time. So this helps people kind of grasp what we're, what we're after when we're, when we're talking about these guiding principles. Um, on Collaboration in Common, which you got the link to earlier, as well as on the CDE website, there's also a link to our longer document. And I do want to it's not a long document. The full document is only, I think it's five or six pages of text with, with some more resources and acknowledgements and those sorts of things. But it's not a, it, it, it's not a heavy read. Um, but I do want to point out that this is the one pager and then there's a more comprehensive document that um, we're going to go through each, very briefly, each of the five guiding principles right now. But what I would encourage you to do, if one of these speaks to you um, as we're talking about them, I encourage you to, to access that, that full document and really um, read through it and, and, and get a better feel for what it is that we're suggesting, recommending um, for each of these, these guiding principles. Also for the guiding principles, I do want to say that these are not standards. Um, we, we realized that in California we needed to set um, kind of a general understanding um, around what is it that we believe around social emotional learning as a state. And our state team was really a very broad, um, um, uh, diverse representative set of folks from across the state, Every, everything from teachers to principals, um, to higher education, um, to researchers, um, um, really all types um, were part of the SEL state team. I think we ended up with about 50 or 60 people that were uh, part of the group that were all um, um, uh, providing input and helping us um, make these the best that they could be and help to really represent what California needs and, and wants around um, social and emotional learning. So with that, I'm gonna move on and let's look at each of them um, with a little more detail. So the first one is this, um, this idea that adopt whole child development as the goal of education. I love the last sentence um, in this one, that districts, uh, schools should not name SEL as a nice to have, but a must have uh, to ensure student success in school, work, and community. And it's also this idea of a systems approach. So again, when we're thinking about um, strategic planning uh, from the school, um, or the district perspective, that, that social emotional learning should be called out explicitly um, in those, those systems documents, those strategic planning documents 
um, we feel that um, it that it needs to be named. Um, and again, not a nice to have, but a, a must have um, when we're talking about the whole child and making sure that they're going to be successful. And type of questions as I'm going along here, but we are a little bit behind on time, so I'm going to move it along. This next next one, I think it was Kevin that brought up the question around equity. So. All students must have opportunities to build SEL skills and receive an assets-based educational experience that is personalized, culturally relevant, and responsive, and intentionally addresses racism and implicit bias. Use practices that build on the existing strengths of students, educators, families, and communities. Uh, we spent a lot of time um, on uh, guiding principle number two um, as, a, as a state team. And we think we've got some really good ideas um, that are in that longer document that we'd love for you um, to, to check out later. Um, and really what this is saying is, is that social and emotional learning shouldn't be for um, a lucky or fortunate group on one side of the railroad tracks, while the other, the, the kids on the other side of the railroad tracks um, don't even have um, the access, the opportunity to be able to interact in a school setting that makes social and emotional learning important. So we believe that when districts are thinking about social emotional learning, um, it shouldn't be for those fortunate few. It, it should be for, for all. Um, earlier this week, um, Superintendent Torlickson, um, he brought together a panel of, of high school students from Contra Costa um, to talk about mental health and wellness um, in their schools and what kinds of opportunities. It was really interesting uh, to hear from this group of students several of which who had started their high school career in a school where mental health, social emotional learning was not seen as a, as a priority and to be quite honest, they didn't know where to go. Um, and then they moved to a high school where it was called out, where um, there, were, there were people that were always available for the students when they needed help, um, when, when, they had, um, when they had questions, when they had trauma in their lives that they wanted to address. Um, it was really interesting to hear a student perspective on thinking about a high school that is doing this really well. And it's not that the school that they came from was doing it poorly. It's just that there wasn't a focus on it. So again, students with a lot of need who are really reflecting on this. And, and again, I think it just speaks to that, to that equity piece. Um, building capacity um, is another piece here. Um, I love the, the, the piece that's been included here around building the capacity of both students and adults through an intentional focus on relationship-centered learning environments and by offering research-based learning experiences that cultivate core social and emotional competencies. Actually, I want to, um, I'm going to take a chance here and um, I'm going to pull up another screen. Do you all see this, um, the, um, this article that I've pulled up right here? Yes, we do. If you want to just increase the size a little bit, we could just pull it out. I think really, really encourage everybody to take a look at this article. Um, it's called The Practice Space for How We Learn, Supporting Students' Social, Emotional, and Ap Academic Development, uh, put out by the Aspen Institute back in March of this year. Um, there's a piece in this um, document that I really enjoy, and I, I challenge when I'm when I'm um, when I'm presenting and working with others around social emotional learning. I ask them to turn to page eight and read this piece called "Social Emotional and Academic Learning for Students." It starts with adults. Um, it's about a two and a half page piece of this article um, that really um, gives you the why on 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 adult social emotional learning and also some provides some really great ideas about how to get things going in your in your district or or in your school um, so really i just wanted to pull this up i, I should have put it in the powerpoint uh, but when i realized i didn't i just i i had it back in the background on my screen so i could share it with you all so um, i just added it to our collaborate and common space for this event yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be great. It's a it's a great read. Um, so let's go. All right. Number four, partnering with families um, and community. Um, so I, I mentioned before that um, you've got to look at all the different organizations and the the range of supports that are happening for students. 
all the way from um, preschool, um, before school um, uh, support, uh, during the school day, after school, summer school, there are so many different um, communities often that are working within a community where you get these silos that happen. And I'm sure that you've all experienced those. I know I sure have. Um, and it's, it's great to really um, make sure that we're including all of these different groups when we're thinking about um, supporting social and emotional learning for our students. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that um, for, for number four. Number five, um, this idea of continuous improvement um, that we need to learn and improve. Again, I, I mentioned the core districts um, uh, in California, which is a, um, a set of, of districts from across California, big districts in most cases, also some smaller districts, but they're doing a lot of work around measurement for social and emotional learning. So some things that you can learn from the work that they've been doing there um, both good and bad. I think that there's some things that they would probably do differently, and they, they talk about that um, in their research, um, but there's also some things that they've learned that, that have really moved the needle um, for whole child education. So um, because this is the Secondary Literacy Partnership, um, we also thought that it would be very important to talk about the integration of social emotional learning um, in the, the academic um, part of the day that, that students are engaged in and teachers are engaged in um, every day. I, in a lot of ways, I feel like um, SEL is a lot like um, literacy in that there, there's a, a segment of the education population that feels like um, literacy stops, literacy instruction stops when students leave the English language arts program. When, when English language arts is over, literacy is over. And we know that that's not the case, that literacy, if, if, done, if done well, um, is really about, um, it's all parts of the day. It's in science, it's in math, that we've really got to support literacy across the content areas. I feel the same thing, same way about social and emotional learning. It's not about setting aside 20 minutes for classroom circles um, at the beginning of the day, and then you're done with your SEL. You can just kind of wipe your hands of, of SEL for the day, but it's about what do you do to integrate it into the work that you're doing, both in your classroom environment, but also um, into the standards. So I'm gonna give everybody just a minute. I think it's probably most efficient to give everybody just a minute to read this, this slide. I do want to point out too, as folks are reading, sorry to interrupt as you're reading, um, but at the very top there's a link. Um, this is a blog um, that, that Berkeley put out. Um, it's been a few years ago, but this is one of my favorite resources um, that helps um, teachers, uh, principals, um, other educators really understand how SEL can fit so neatly into, um, into the common core. Um, there, we've got a couple of examples here around how it can fit in the English language arts standards, this one being described characters in a story, um, but there are also examples for math and for science um, and for history social science that I think are also very, um, they're, they're just, they're packaged in a way that I think the teachers can really, they can grab onto this and understand how integration with SEL can happen very naturally um, into, the, into the content. So we're, how are we on time here, you guys? Uh, we have to wrap up. If yeah. I, yep. so, <laughs> no, I know we could go on for a long time, but um, I'm just sort of looking at the time and thinking about um, having time for some discussion in small groups. So yeah. Here's, does anyone have any questions? I, we, let me just, let me say this one um, very quickly. Here's another example for writing um, around this kind of idea of collaboration. Um, and another example of how SEL can fit into a, a writing lesson um, very neatly um, and, um, and not get in the way of instruction, but, but just the opposite, that really um, it, it, um, 
it really supports the instruction and helps to make it even stronger. So, and again, that Berkeley article has quite a few examples just like this. Brent, thank you so much. We've been posting some of the resources and pieces that you've built in the chat as we went along and it is recorded. And I'm just going to ask any questions. We're going to now turn over to breaking out into small groups and have Jennifer explain that. But I want to know if anyone wants to unmute their phone to have a quick comment or question as we do that. If you want to just stop sharing your screen, we can transition. I'm going to stop the sharing now. And we put, and now links right, we've, we've uh, put all of these resources up in our Collaborate and Comment space um, where we, uh, maybe I'll just show this to you really quickly and share. So when we say a Collaborate and Comment space, we have a, 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 a spot where I just um, put up these resources to do with the webinar. There's going to be our slides. These are other items we'll point to, the guides, the examples of the work as well as the resource that I just quick, quickly put up that Brett did. So just to let you know, these are the pieces that we are curating for you as we go along. Um, so Jennifer, do you wanna share quickly as uh, folks type in any questions? And Brent, thank you for doing a quick uh, overview. I know we could have broken out and discussed these in much more detail. Yeah, hopefully my time management was okay. Sorry about that. Oh, fantastic. No, we just, it's never enough hours in the day. I know, right? I can see all the smiles on everyone's faces. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go ahead and um, look at some practices within the classroom to integrate SEL into a variety of different contexts. Um, you should have already gotten the, um, or received the, the articles that we're going to be looking at for this today. Um, one of them is from um, Castle, and it goes specifically over um, English language arts practices um, for 11th grade. But hopefully as you guys were scanning through them, you saw that a lot of these things, they, they, aren't, um, they aren't regulated to English language arts classrooms, right? Um, that they can often be used in a lot of different classrooms. Um, and even like practices that parents can use at home in order to, uh, um, to continue SEL education at home as well. Um, and then we also have um, the article that we uh, looked at earlier today um, about microwriting having a macro impact on um, identity development. And so in essence, what we're going to do is, um, as uh, we explained earlier, um, we're going to break out into four breakout rooms and each um, each breakout room is going to be facilitated. Um, Aline's going to be facilitating one, I'm going to be facilitating one, and then Brent and Julie will be taking one as well. Um, and then within each breakout room, we're going to be discussing a section of, um, <coughs> of the uh, Castle article. So the first breakout group will be discussing self-awareness, the second will be discussing self-management, uh, the third will be discussing social awareness, and the final one, relationship skills and responsible decision making. And so within each breakout room, your facilitator will be pulling up both the CASEL document um, to look at your particular, um, particular group assignments, as well as the micro writing article, just in case you would like to have some seeds for conversation. And then your facilitator is also going to be um, taking notes on the, um, the things that you guys talk about. It's not just going to be um, in chat. You guys will have the opportunity to uh, uh, share your thoughts verbally over the phone as well, or you could stay in chat if you like, if you're like me and you're shy and you would rather just type things in. Um, and then we're going to be looking at these two questions in particular. Uh, the first one is, um, what is one practice or activity you'd like to try in your classroom? And the second is, what is a practice or activity that you have questions about? So uh, maybe like you uh, um, want to see if someone has tried it before um, and any successes or challenges that they've had. Uh, maybe you want to like kind of like talk it out a little bit to kind of see what it would be like, um, things like that. And remember, these, um, these practices, these activities, uh, even though it says for uh, ELA classrooms, it can be applicable uh, throughout the discipline. Um, anything else that you want to add, Julie, about just kind of like the technical side of it? 
No, we'll get a warning when we're about to come back into our groups. We'll really encourage you if you're just on the phone only, we'll see where you end up because we have, we'll try that that way. And we um, just would love for you to discuss and, and share some of your thoughts basically in this breakout back from what we've heard today and what these items can do with you moving forward. So we'll break out now and you'll see a breakout and we'll move forward. Thank you, Jennifer. I have, a, you have on your screen, join breakout room and please select that. Reporting out, Brent, your group. Yeah, so um, I don't want to brag, but I think the social awareness group was the was the best group. <laughs> <laughs> so um, competition. Where no. does this fit in? Competition and social emotional learning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm filling buckets right now. Um, so what? Um, so we had a great conversation. It was we. I think we could have gone on for quite a while. I would say probably the biggest realization for me is is that I need to dig into these articles, and I that that may be true for Kevin and Rand. I don't want to speak for them, but there's a lot more to uh, to digest here. But um, as far as the um, the wow for the uh, the micro writing article, uh, as far as um, awareness, we said. Focusing areas of concern for the school, almost like advocacy work for, for work to happen in the school, that these this micro right could be a really great way to um, to build voice for students um, around things that they want to see happen in their school. Um, we talked about behavior and adopt strategies that build student SEL capacity, things like peer mediation and restorative circles. Um, that would help students define their emotion. And we thought that sentence starters could be a really great way um, to get students, like one student creates a sentence starter, then somebody else answers it, and then you have a conversation around it to really kind of help describe what their emotions are. Um, then I think it was Rand that talked about establishing norms um, um, that, that are, are so important when we're doing, when we're working in groups. Um, so those were those were some of the, the notes. The how um, or what is a practice or activity that you have questions about was how closely aligned is this to the ELA curriculum? And we just talked about it can be difficult with all of the other requirements that happen in ELA and other subject areas and just the um, kind of that ask of if you present it as one more thing, you probably get in trouble um, with with teachers who are super, super busy people. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Those were some of the ones that we had for the micro writing. We also, we really liked the, um, the castle piece, but we, we didn't get too far down that road. Fantastic. Arlene, do you want to report out? Thanks. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, Delphine, thank you very much for being our note taker. There were three of us in the room, Marianne and Betty, both from New York, so I believe they've already had their dinner, so they're very dedicated <laughs> to this webinar. Um, and Chona, who is from California, so um, it was a great conversation. And we did, do, uh, uh, fo we did focus a bit on vocabulary and how important um, it was to make sure the students were understanding the vocabulary to help them become more in engaged in those lessons and address uh, their difficulties so that they don't immediately just shut off. Um, we also talked a bit about uh, students seeing the dialogue in characters in novels to identify with them, feel comfortable sharing feelings of their own. That sort of gives them sort of an avenue by seeing themselves in the characters. Um, it was... Uh, really great toward the end because those were some of the wows that stood out but one of the wonderings was how uh, how do you address the challenges of um, putting students in groups who have uh, emotional who are emotionally disturbed and have challenges um, with even interacting with each other and so uh, Chona posed that question because those are the students that she works with and Marianne and Betty were able to provide some good uh, suggestions on that. Wonderful. And, uh, one of those suggestions was putting uh, pictures of emotions on the wall. And, and Betty or Marianne, if you'd like to add to that, you're welcome to. Um, we have these wonderful, um, and we're doing SEL, our, our entree in is with young students. 
Um, but these posters from the Cephal website that have faces with pictures of emotions and was Chona was talking about her students, I thought that could be helpful for them. And I happened to have won one of these in a basket. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh! And so it's sitting on my floor. I'm going to be giving it to my niece. But just the beginning of emotions and you know, if if she's if Jonah, if you're working with students that are that are having um, emotional difficulties, the the pictures could be helpful along with the words, and there could even be a range of emotions under a picture. So anyway, yes, thank you, Betty. Betty, can you spell the cephal in the chart? I mean, it's it's like the castle, only right. the okay. yes. site. I will do that. I'll toss it in the chat. Just in light of time, we'll thank you, everyone. We'll go on to um, Jennifer, your team, your um, group. Okay. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Mary Jane. Uh, so we had um, another Jennifer <laughs> and Kara in the group with us. And um, we had talked a lot about um, just the importance of uh, really just integrating this within lessons that like as Bren was saying that if you uh, say it's like one more thing then you're not going to get a whole lot of buy-in but we were talking about how like really this needs to be uh, like integrated into uh, into everything that we do that it's not just one more thing it doesn't add to your day it's just something that you do and that you can't really deliver lessons without um, kind of like establishing these norms I'm a, uh, kind of modeling these sort of behavior. And we've talked about um, like, you know, everyone wants like really rich collaborative discussion with their students. But if you're not going to uh, model that to give them kind of a structure to work within, to give them the opportunity to define these sorts of emotions, what it means to them, what it means to characters and stories, um, figures in history, things like that, right? That you're not going to have that rich discussion. And so really to arrive at the sort of, um, of kind of like, you know, like classroom activities that you want, uh, you need to have these SEL practices that sort of um, embedded in everything that you do. And um, we also talked about how like literacy, as we said, is, is cross-discipline, right? It doesn't just reside in ELA. And it's the same thing with SEL, that there's overlap in everything. And so we need to make sure that everything is connected. Um, is there anything else, uh, Jennifer and Kara, that I um, left out that you would like to, to really call out? Oh, I don't believe so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, I you won't see notes in my section, Delphine. So I'm just going to. I have my notes here because no, you know, we're all so different. So my notes were quickly here, but I'm going to talk over to Linda, who volunteered to um, give the three highlights in the time that we have. Linda, over to you. I don't, I don't know if I remember all three highlights. Um, I work mostly in early childhood, so um, we always talk about in real estate that the key is relationship. The key is uh, location, location, location. In early childhood, we say it's relationships, relationships, relationships. So really everything that we do with children and families is built on that common ground of trust and relationships. Thank you, Linda. So I think the big ha has was that it, it maps for in early childhood. Preschool has their standards so we can learn with them. And the wonder was, in relationships is how do we do conflict measurement where our relationships are so much online and digital media so that was one of our wonders about the relationships and building was the the way that the new social media plays into that and here we're going to talk about media literacy in our next series so with that i think we should thank you all for sharing and uh, we're wrapping up brent we're going to put some last questions up there if you want to contact you. Do you have some just last thoughts as we wrap up here and tell folks about next steps? We have the face-to-face um, the -face for those who are in and able to come and attend. So I'll ask you to just reflect on some of the finishing pieces as I share resources out. Yeah, I mean, well, again, I'd just like to say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and um, I think a, you guys have done a great job of putting together this this platform. So thank you for for that, for 
provide a, a platform to talk about social emotional learning as something that is important for integrating into the school day. I mean, that's really, I think, at the end of the day, um, a great SEL curriculum is important and can be really helpful, but it's when, um, when, when educators and families and kids really see SEL as the lens from which we do our work, um, that's when things really start to move and happen. Um, would again just um, offer the community of practice that we have going on here at the Sacramento County Office of Education. Again, it's free. Um, it's a nine to three kind of commitment on November 13th. Um, would encourage you if you did decide if that was something you wanted to do, would love for you to come with a team because again, we do, we operate under this kind of team planning piece. Um, so again, uh, you've got my email as part of the PowerPoint. If you have questions about the guiding principles or about anything that, um, that I was talking about today would, would, um, would welcome questions and the opportunity to have further conversation. But um, just thank you. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Brent. And um, definitely um, appreciate everyone being on with us. We love your feedback. As I said, this is the first time we've done it in this model. Please stay in touch with us. If you're not already on our newsletter, we'd, uh, please join. Um, always curious how people find out about these webinars and so welcome that our folks from New York were with us around the country as well as California. Next slide. We have a host of good, can we go to the next slide? We're really excited about our channel. We have a channel in um, Collaborate in Common that I can share that has all, they said, all of these wonderful archives of folks sharing and about secondary literacy, specifically on our collection. You talked about embedding it in the curriculum, our discipline literacy series from uh, last um, series. They really gave examples of teachers doing it in the science and um, science and history classroom and really embedding it with um, tech with literacy. So next, uh, next slide. I think it's just a big thank you to you all for attending. And Arlene, would you like to say, um, finishing comments and thank folks from the heart of the California Department. And we're putting up a little poll to help us give some feedback specifically on our first time of viewing Zoom groups Why Arlene finishes off our thank yous. Yes. I did, oh, did go ahead. Zoom real quick, I'm sorry. What email did all the <laughs> places to find documents come in? I will send it to you. If you okay, send up with the group, you'll get a follow-up email with everything. So I know we'll send it out and all the things that were shared today, you'll get a link to. Thank you. And now you can ask that. <laughs> oh, no worries. Yeah, so this is Aline and I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, please do check out the other webinars that the Secondary Literacy Partnership has put together, as well as uh, the Collaboration in Common webpage that Julie showed uh, that has the Secondary Literacy Partnership resources. And within Collaboration in Common, just in case anyone is confused about it, there is also a page for just dedicated to social, emotional, social and emotional learning. And I encourage you to uh, check that out as well, because not only does it contain the guiding principles, but soon it will contain a resource uh, document that is quite lengthy and has many, many resources in it, but we're just going through the final publishing phases of that. And within that document will be a, um, an, e an email box address that you can also communicate with our team here at the CDE. Uh, with any additional questions. So thank you all so much for attending. Thank you. We're officially finishing this webinar. We'll send you the links to the archives and other materials to share with you and your colleagues. Please give us some feedback on our group activity and have a rest of a wonderful evening and day. And thank you for all the hard work. And Brent, thank you for joining us and leading this. My pleasure. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Delphine.